Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for the Conversation Cafe on Impossible Foods, featuring Pat Brown of Impossible Foods. Briefly, before we get started, I'm going to talk about what we do um, at USC Sustainability. We work on a variety of initiatives on and off campus. Um, our initiatives relate to recycling and waste management, energy and water, food, transportation, climate, and green building. If you want to hear about more events like this, you can always join our newsletter, which is available on our website at musc.edu slash go green. You can find us on social media at MUSC Go Green, or if you in, you're an MUSC employee, you can find us on Yammer under broadcast hyphen sustainability. So during the event, feel free to ask questions. We'll be asking Pat some questions, and then we're going to turn it over to audience questions later in the event. You can ask questions through either the mobile app or on a desktop. We have directions on the mobile app. You're going to want to select the three dots in the bottom and then select the Q&A. And on the desktop, there should be a small panel that you can expand on the bottom right. So for today's event, we are actually collaborating with the College of Charleston Center for Sustainable Development and the lovely Dr. Ashley Lavender, who's joining us here today. Hi, Ashley. And she's the Associate Director and Internship Coordinator for the College of Charleston's Center for Sustainable Development. Hi, everybody. And we also have Dr. Pat Brown here today from Impossible Foods. Um, a little bit about Dr. Brown, a short bio, is Dr. Brown is the CEO and founder of Impossible Foods. The idea for Impossible Foods came to Pat while on sabbatical from his position at, as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and professor of biochemistry at the Stanford University School of Medicine. In reflecting on how he could use his training and expert and experience to make the largest positive impact on the world, he realized there was a way to make delicious and affordable plant-based foods to serve the planet. In 2010, he co-founded Lyrical Foods, maker of Kite Hill artisanal nut milk-based cheeses and yogurts. And in 2011, he chose to devote himself full-time to Impossible Foods. After receiving his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of University of Chicago, Dr. Brown completed a residency in pediatrics at Chicago's Children's Memorial Hospital. As a fellow, he defined the mechanism by which HIV and other retroviruses incorporate their genes into the genomes of the cells they infect. At Stanford, he and colleagues developed DNA microarrays, a new technology that made it possible to monitor the activity of all the genes in a genome, along with the first methods for analyzing, visualizing, and interpreting global gene expression programs. He pioneered the use of gene expression patterns to classify cancers and improve prediction of their clinical course, earning him the American Cancer Society Medal of Honor. Dr. Brown is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and Institute of Medicine, and he also co-founded the Public Library of Science, PLOS, a nonprofit scientific publication that has transformed the publishing industry by making scientific research freely available to the public. So with that, I want to thank Pat for joining us, and we will start our Q&A. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to start out with a fun question here. Um, how do you like your burger? Any uh, fun toppings or any other way that you prefer your burger? Oh, uh you know, it's I, I've been out of the burger eating business for such a large fraction of my life. I'm I'm still kind of relearning my preferences, but um, uh, I'd say uh, I like it pretty simple. But I like uh, avocado on it and uh, <laughs> spicy hot peppers. That's, that's about it. West Coast burger. I guess it's a West Coast thing. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Ashley. We're going to be going back and forth for questions here. She has the next question. Hi, Pat. So why, is the, Hi. why is the Impossible Burger better than a meat-based burger? Oh, so many reasons. Um, first of all, 
uh, in uh, blind taste tests, uh, more than 40% of current meat eaters prefer it to the um, typical cow-based burger, uh, just one tasted blindly. And when, uh, when they learn, to their surprise, that it's made from plants, a majority of them say they prefer it and would rather buy it. Uh, and the reason is because um, it's kind of counterintuitive, uh, but then once you think about it, of course it makes perfect sense. Meat lovers love their meat because they love the way it tastes, they love the whole sensory experience, um, uh, they use it for, they use uh, ground beef for all sorts of dishes that are familiar and comfort foods and so forth. Um, it, they like it as a source of protein. They like it as a source of iron, uh, in spite of the fact in, that it's, it's made the way it is from the carcass of an animal. And, um, uh, and when you ask them, I mean, basically all our data says, and you should ask your, your audience, if it was live, I'd do a question right now. But I suspect that most or all of them are current uh, meat eaters. But if you ask them, as part of the value of meat, the fact that it's made the way it is, you know, from a corpse, um, uh, very few of them would say that's actually part of the value proposition. It's something they accept because it's always been the way that uh, the meat that they like has been made, and uh, and they've learned to live with that. So anyway, so the, the the surprising thing is that our product is when you're asking how is it better. Well, the most important thing is it's preferred by most meat eaters once they've tasted it. Of course, the problem is getting them to taste it in the first place because their their past experience with plant-based meat products is that they suck. And uh, so they have a very high barrier to trial. We know that once they try it, actually, of, of all the meat eaters who have ever tried our product, more than 70% of them have become repeat customers. And when you when you interview them afterwards, like 95% of them say they intend to become repeat customers. So um, so that's just that's that's a practical thing about it. But in terms of uh, the health benefits, the Impossible Burger is lower calorie, lower fat, lower saturated fat, zero cholesterol, no fecal bacteria, no antibiotics or hormones used in producing it. Uh, same protein content, same protein quality, uh, um, same iron content, same iron quality, same micronutrient content. So it's basically the stuff you want from your meat without the stuff you don't want from your meat. Finally, the environmental benefits. So the whole purpose from, you know, the whole reason I got into this is that the use of animals to make food is by far the most destructive technology on earth. Ask me follow-up questions about that, but I'll just I'll just um, give you the the uh, you know some high-level numbers about about the Impossible Burger compared to the cow version. <clears throat> so if you choose if you eat a pound of Impossible Burger in place of the cow version, um, every pound that that you replace is the equivalent of driving. Uh, 36.5 fewer miles in a typical American car. So basically the average daily commute for an American uh, nullified by replacing one pound. Uh, that's also uh, another way of looking at it. It's 92 miles flown in a passenger jet, okay? Uh, is how much, how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions you spare um, by that choice. Um, you save water equivalent to the average daily use in an American household with one pound of Impossible Burger instead of the cow version. And you save a land area of 290 square feet, which to put in perspective is uh, a land area that supports about one and a half trees in the Amazon. So the point is the demand for beef is almost entirely responsible for the ongoing deforestation of the Amazon. Every time you reduce your demand for cow, you know, cow beef um, by replacing it with an impossible burger, you save one and a half trees in the Amazon. Okay. Uh, so those are the benefits. There's more, but I'm just gonna stop there. Thank you. Great. I think it was a great answer. Um 
So taking a small step back, and this is kind of a background question, but what inspired you to start Impossible Foods? And how many years did it take to create the Impossible Burger? Well, the main thing that inspired uh, me to start it was um, when I had a sabbatical and I took the time to, you know, my, my, my goal I set myself was to pick the most important problem I could contribute to solving. When I started looking into what that might be, I very quickly realized, and I assumed there was going to be some tr- addressing some environmental issue, but I really had nothing, no, it didn't even have that as a constraint. But I very quickly realized that um, by far the biggest threat uh, to our future and to future generations uh, that the world is facing right now is the catastrophic impact of the use of animals for food. And that's something that, you know, to a lot of people, even people who are pretty uh, aware of environmental issues, uh, comes as a surprise. Although, um, at this point, I would say most people who are uh, um, studying global environmental issues have come around to that point of view. In fact, the UN Environmental Program uh, uh, declared that fact almost 10 years ago, that by far the most destructive technology on earth is the use of animals to produce food. And um, again, I, I can go into all the ways in which in which that's true. Um, it's by far the biggest driver of uh, uh, a catastrophic collapse in global biodiversity, which is very far advanced and, and, uh, and heading fast in a bad direction. Um, it, it, it's responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions. It's actually four times more greenhouse gas emissions than Exxon, BP, Shell Oil, and Chevron combined. Four times more than all the greenhouse gas emissions from all the fuel that they produce. Um, and um, it uses and pollutes more water than any other industry. And has a land footprint that's about 45% of the entire land surface of Earth, okay, actively in use producing animals for food, which is a, uh, the, the main reason why it's so overwhelmingly uh, the culprit for this catastrophic collapse in, in biodiversity. There are today 60% fewer mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish living on Earth than there were 45 years ago, almost entirely due to the impact of, of uh, animal agriculture on land and overfishing uh, in the water. And um, so anyway, the point is when I became aware of those facts, it also was obvious to me that you're not gonna solve the problem by telling people to change their diets because that never works. It's China tried doing that like three years ago, they told their citizens to cut back their meat and dairy consumption by half and what happened was absolutely nothing. Even though China's a lot better at getting its citizens to do what it wants uh, than practically any government on earth, this time it failed. And, uh, and, and there have been many attempts to get people by education, all kinds of tools of persuasion to get people to, to change their diets, healthier diets, better for the environment, does not work. People do not like to give up the foods they love. Um, so that meant that the only way to solve the problem was to compete in the marketplace, the most subversive institution on earth, the marketplace, and um, and collapse the uh, animal-based food industry by basically um, uh, very strategically taking their markets away, eroding their markets, and and messing with their economics. And that meant private business. And uh, so I went and raised money to start Impossible Foods. And and basically, you know, again, we started out by being almost entirely an R&D organization because we knew uh, nutrition is not the problem. And um, there, there, if you want to eliminate animals from the food system, the nutritional problem is already solved. In fact, this year's soybean crop contains 50% more human usable protein than all the meat consumed globally, okay? There's more protein in this year's global soybean crop by 50% than in all the meat consumed globally. And yet that soybean crop is going on 0.8% of Earth's land area as compared to 45% of Earth's land area to produce meat the way we're doing it now. So from a nutrition standpoint, uh, um, there's no problem to solve. From a cost standpoint, 
protein from plants, you can you can match the protein content of meat for about one twenty fifth the cost of the cheapest meat on the market using readily available plant sources. So nutrition and cost are not a problem. Deliciousness is the problem because nobody, you know, who is a mainstream omnivore who loves meat considers soybeans an acceptable substitute or any of the other plant-based proteins that that uh, plant-based products that could provide uh, the nutritional equivalent. And so the research focus on possible foods was on the most important scientific question in the world, which is what makes meat delicious? And it's the most important scientific question in the world because if we can answer it in a way that enables us to um, produce meat that outperforms the animal-derived meat, we um, uh, solve, we eliminate the greatest threat uh, that humanity is facing right now. Uh, and so that's, that's how we approach it strategically. And let me just say one more thing about the mission of the company when I founded it. It's to completely replace animals as a food technology by 2035. And that time is important because the problems that we're addressing, which is the relentless progression of climate change and the catastrophic collapse of biodiversity, if we don't, if we don't decisively intervene soon, uh, we're going to be in such a shit show. Um, you know, so this so speed is of the essence. Every day matters. Great. Yeah, and then uh, so starting with as R and D. How long did it take from there to create the Impossible Burger we know now? Well, first of all, the, just a, one preface. We're constantly improving the Impossible Burger, and this is our decisive advantage over the cow. The cow stopped working on this problem a million years ago, <laughs> and, and we have some of the best scientists in the world working on it every single day. And we're not going to stop until our product in every way that matters to consumers is vastly superior to the cow version. But we, um, uh, when I found the company, we basically started out studying meat the way in my old life we would study a disease or something like that, which is trying to understand in, in molecular terms what makes it work. Okay, how does it work? And, and how animal tissue works as meat is completely different from how it works as tissue in a living animal and actually was quite poorly understood. Um, so so we, we studied that and we also focused at the same time as we learned about what are the essential molecular components that, that participate in creating the flavors and aromas and textures and juiciness and stuff like that that meat lovers value. Uh, we were looking for scalable... Uh, cost-effective plant ingredients that that match the precise properties that that mattered for uh, you know meat as a food. So that was just basic basic research. And in fact, we didn't even start working on a prototype until about two years in. We were just building the knowledge base and and the toolkit and so forth. And of course, that's still going on. Um, about two years in, we decided, okay, now we got to decide what. You know, we were just studying meat as a category, every kind of meat and fish and also dairy foods and all this stuff. But then we decided, okay, now we gotta gotta make a product and we gotta pick something. And we picked raw ground beef. And just to make it clear why we made that choice, of course, it's the, the best selling kind of meat in the US right now, uh, ground beef and the most popular. Um, more than half of all the beef produced in the US is sold as ground beef. So it's a critical part of the business model of the beef industry which our goal is to disrupt. And uh, about 25% of all the beef produced in the U.S. can only be sold as ground beef because it's these nasty little cuts of meat that no one wants to buy, no one wants to look at, um, so they get sold as ground beef. So it's actually, you know, in, in order to get full value from a cow, you gotta, you gotta be able to sell ground beef at, at, uh, profitably. And, um, and also it's iconic. So the first thing we needed to communicate, communicate to consumers is uncompromisingly delicious meat uh, doesn't have to come from an animal. And the, the, you know, the burger is the perfect vehicle for conveying that message. So we decided to work on ground beef. And when we first made a prototype based on all the stuff we learned, uh, it was characterized by people who tasted it as uh, tasting like rancid polenta. 
Um, but that's the way it works. That's the way innovation happens. You know, you start taking what you know, uh, trying to uh, apply it, uh, learn what's wrong with that, iterate, iterate, iterate. And we actually go through something like uh, uh, an average of at least three iterations a day where just for our current product, the, the burger, where we're testing ways of improving it. So um, that process is is cranking all the time. Um, it took us, uh, it wasn't until uh, 2015, it was about four years in, that we had a product that we were ready to um, sell to consumers. And we were testing it by, you know, um, we had to hold ourselves a high bar. We're not interested in producing the best veggie burger on the planet. We're, we wanted to produce something that for a large fraction of meat lovers was better than the cow version. And that's a high bar. And no plant-based food company before or since has ever really defined that as their goal. And we were using uh, you know, hardcore chefs to test whether it was good enough. Um, and um, so when we launched, because we were working with all these, these were hardcore like meat icon chefs. Um, the very first uh, restaurant that served our product was one that's run by a chef called Dave Chang, who is arguably the best, most widely recognized chef on earth. And he is recognized as a hardcore meat guy who something like three or four years ago, uh, or maybe a little longer, uh, famously banished every vegetarian item from his menu, just on principle, and was picketed by PETA and so forth as a result. So. He is a perfect guy for us because if we if if we can make a product that he considers good enough as meat to put on his menu as meat, this meat uncompromising guy, uh, you know, then we know it's ready. So um, when when we got that endorsement from him and other chefs, uh, we were good to go, and and it, you know we debuted that product in in uh, one of his restaurants in New York. And then with uh, the uh, other chefs that we launched with were also basically globally recognized chefs who uh, recognize as being completely uncompromising. And, and there's no greater endorsement uh, than having someone like that put your product on the menu because they're putting their livelihood and their reputation on the line. And, um, you know, the menu is a highly curated statement about what that chef values as food. So, um, you know, it was strategically valuable for us to do that, to launch that way. Great. Thank you. So, yeah. So speaking of the burger itself, can you talk a little bit about what actually, like some of the ingredients, so you talked about the iterations that were required of your, you know, it's a continuous improvement process, right? But could you give us just an idea of what's in the current version or the or the one that has been uh, more widely marketed at this point? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, the uh, uh, the major by mass ingredient other than water is uh, soy protein. Um, and uh, just as a parenthetical statement, um, soy protein, I think probably most nutritionists know, but most other people don't know, uh, is actually from a protein quality standpoint by the, so to speak, PDCAS score, which is sort of an international scoring system for protein quality, equivalent to beef protein, okay? Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, animal protein is the only complete protein. It's complete bullshit. Um, and actually, soy protein from a, from a human nutrition standpoint is demonstrably just as good. But anyway, okay, soy protein is the major protein source. Uh, the major uh, fat source is coconut oil and uh, sunflower oil. Um, and uh, we have uh, a, uh, um, a uh, carbohydrate, methyl cellulose, that uh, is a minor component, but... Um, but provides some of the soluble fiber as well as the uh, um, kind of binding properties. Uh, and then um, we have various micronutrients, amino acids, vitamins, and so forth that actually are the precursors 
for the flavors, most of the flavors that are unmistakably meat. And finally, the magic ingredient is um, a heme protein. In our case, it's uh, a heme protein that's naturally found in, in soy, but one that we produce by using genetically engineered yeast. Um, and the, the role of that heme protein, so in muscle tissue, there's a protein myoglobin, uh, which is a heme protein. Uh, it's that protein that makes meat look red or pink. Um, and it's actually the heme molecule in that protein that, uh, and uh, it's it, it has a role in, in oxygen uh, binding and transport in muscle tissue and so forth. The one we use is like hemoglobin. It has a role in oxygen binding and transport in uh, the um, nitrogen fixing uh, organ of a soybean plant, uh, which is called a root nodule, which is bright red when you cut it open in the summer. Even most soybean farmers don't know that. You got to spend more time looking at at the roots of your plants. But anyway, um, and um, so we discovered uh, very early on that uh, heme. So let me just say something about heme. Heme is essential for life on Earth. Every living cell depends on heme. The reason that cyanide will kill you is because it binds to heme and blocks uh, one of its essential roles, which is in the sort of energy generating system that every cell uses to burn calories to make energy that the cell can use and so forth. Um, and, um, and that's essential even for plants and bacteria and, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, very high on the list of the most important biomolecules on Earth. In, in your experience, the most familiar role of heme is in your blood. It's the molecule that carries oxygen from your lungs to your tissues. It's what makes your blood red. Um, and uh, it, it turns out it, it has, uh, the reason that I suspected it was going to be the catalyst here is that uh, um, there are many enzymes, uh, hundreds of enzymes in your body. Enzymes are, are proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. Uh, that use heme as the catalytic element. And for example, all the enzymes that are involved in uh, synthesizing steroid hormones, I shouldn't say, no. some of the enzymes that are involved in synthesizing every steroid hormone. I don't know what happened. I think the, the connection is getting kind of crappy here. But, um, uh, I, okay, just quickly finishing on, on heme protein. So, so it turns out that, that heme is the catalytic element in some of the most essential enzymes in your body. Um, what our team discovered, because we suspected heme was, was critical for flavor, is that it turns out that heme is almost the, the, the answer to why meat tastes like meat and unlike anything from the plant world. Because if you just took a vegetable broth, just some mild, nondescript vegetable broth uh, um, that's, you know, maybe a little savory tasting, but kind of bleh, and then you throw in heme, uh, and and cook it, it turns into meat. It just tastes exactly like like meat. Uh, um, if the precursors are right, it tastes exactly like beef and smells like beef. And heme is also what catalyze uh, the catalyst that produces the bloody flavor of raw meat, or for that matter, bloody flavor of blood. Um, and it does that by catalyzing a chemical reaction in your mouth that uses an abundant fatty acid, linoleic acid, as a precursor and produces these potent odorant molecules that smell and taste like blood in your mouth. Um, and um, so anyway, it's an amazing molecule, but we discovered that. And that was um, one of many, many things that we had discovered to make a delicious burger, but, but the most critical one for flavor. That makes sense. Well, the science behind that is really interesting. I didn't know a lot of that. Um, I have another question for you, which is slightly a change of gears, um, but it relates to some questions I'm seeing in the Q&A thread. Um, so this is in relation to the 2019 life cycle assessment by Qantas. Um, and in this, the Impossible Burger, you know, used 96% less land and the water and all the stats that you brought up earlier compared to a conventional mass-produced beef burger. But I was curious if you guys have considered including other types of beef production, such as like grass fed or other types of cattle raising in a life cycle assessment? Because I know that has been one thing that has been brought up, um, is that this is a comparison to 
fairly the most standard beef that people eat, but there might be other more sustainable options. So yeah, I think that it's there. interesting. The meat industry is like the most they 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 make the Russians look like amateurs when it comes to disinformation. Um, the uh, um, so there's this there's first of all, um, you know, grass fed beef production is way more land intensive. Okay, um, you, you know, you can produce a, a ton of calories to pump into a cow. You know, growing corn and and stuff like that, you know, the things that, that are feed crops and so forth with a lot less land. Now, I'm not advocating that, but I'm just telling you that that's true. And, and that's well, well known among people who, who look at these environmental assessments. So grass-fed ground beef is more land intensive. And it's the land intensiveness that's probably the biggest problem with the industry, okay? That land that the cows are on, um, you know, they like to show you pictures of, of you know, beautiful, lush, grassy fields and so forth. But uh, um, it's very rare that they actually look like that. But the more critical thing to keep in mind is, well, you could do the same thing in Brazil. And you could look at the places where they burned down the rainforest, and now they're growing grass and feeding cows. And they probably look, once the smoke clears, they probably look like, you know, nice grassy lawns and so forth. But you've lost a vast amount of, of uh, plant biomass that is now CO2 in the atmosphere, and uh, as well as habitat for biodiversity. It's this land footprint that's that's really a catastrophe. So, um, uh, and being grass-fed, believe me, does not solve that problem. Um, you can look at, uh, uh, you know, I, I actually have a picture which I, I, I could show you if I, I, it would be take too much time, but um, it's basically a picture I took when I was walking on the trail uh, in the Point Reyes National Park, which is a, a just a, a park in national park in California, but there's there's a fence, and on one side it's national park, and on the other side it's 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 a grass fed beef farm. Okay, and you can look on one side of the fence. There's lush plant life, supporting birds and biodiversity. On the other side, it's like a wasteland. Okay, covered with cows. Um, so you just have to be realistic. The fact is that grass-fed, it just sounds so nice, you know. Uh, that's why it's part of this kind of ridiculous disinformation campaign. The other thing is that the fact is that, uh, um, you know, these sort of idealized uh, farms that, that people like to throw at you when you're dissing the beef industry is a, a rounding error in terms of its fraction of the market. Um, so it's almost irrelevant to the conversation. But like I say, even still, it's premised on a false premise, which is that somehow that's environmentally sounder. Uh, it's nicer for the cows. It's not nicer for the planet. Yeah, definitely understand it. Real quick, I actually have a follow-up on that related to things that keep popping up in the Q&A. Um, one criticism is that you know through using this as a plant-based product, you're supporting um, monocropping, which can be devastating. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about that as a follow-up. Sure. Um, so there's a couple of levels to that. Uh, what? How is it possible that there is 50% more protein in the soybean crop than there is in all the meat consumed globally? It's because when you feed um, soybeans or some other protein source to a cow, it takes 30 grams of protein in to get one gram of protein in the form of beef, okay? Uh, and when you feed it to a pig, it's about 11 to one. Um, and so those soybeans and the corn, which is the other you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, typical uh, massive monocrop, are almost entirely used to feed animals and converted into meat with ridiculous efficiency. So just to just to just to address that, and then I'll get on to another level of the answer. We we if we were producing meat the way that Impossible Food produces it, we would need we could get rid of almost all the corn crop globally. Uh, we could um, reduce the amount of soybeans grown, even if soybean is our main protein ingredient. 
we need a lot less of it because we get one-to-one -one conversion efficiency of soy protein into human dietary protein. So now why are we using soybeans um, uh, as a major ingredient? Well, uh, when we were doing our initial research, it turns out that you know soy protein is not was not our first choice. But in order for us to be able to scale, we need to use a protein that's already uh, um, produced at scale. We can't wait until we reinvent the whole agricultural system before getting started on this. And um, and soy protein has great nutritional qualities, and uh, you know it's it's there's a good supply chain uh, for it, but. In the future, I think one of the things that we're working on is uh, a protein that is, I think, going to be a huge part of the uh, food system, which is protein from leaves. So most of the protein consumed by most of the animals on Earth comes from leaves, okay? Um, seems, I mean, it's true anyway. Uh, and most of the protein on Earth is in leaves. Um, or, or in photosynthetic uh, um, single cell organisms. And um, that protein has amazing qualities for food. First of all, it's got a, uh, almost optimal uh, essential amino acid content uh, for human use. And it's got uh, particularly the, the most abundant protein on Earth is a protein called rubisco. It's a, a, the, the enzyme that does the, the carbon fixation step in photosynthesis. And it represents about 25 to, to 45% of all the protein content of every leaf, okay? And this protein has unbelievably good functional properties for food, meaning uh, it's got, so seed storage proteins tend to be very poorly water soluble. They're designed that way. Um, Rubisco and other intracellular proteins are designed to be highly water soluble. They evolved to be water soluble because they have to exist in very high concentrations in a water environment. Water solubility is an extremely valuable property for a food protein. So actually, some of our early burger prototypes were produced using Rubisco instead of soy protein. Okay, and and actually, in many respects, it performed better. But we couldn't. You know, we couldn't wait until we built a supply chain for it. But in the long run, the thing about thing about using leaf proteins as as an ingredient is that um, they are highly evolutionarily conserved. If that, if that makes any sense, they the 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 major the abundant proteins in a plant cell are very very similar in, in their structural and functional properties, whether they come from you know, uh, a fern or a grass or alfalfa or whatever, okay? They're highly evolutionarily conserved. And, and that means that you can use a very similar process to isolate proteins from a wide variety of plants, which means that if you're using that as your major protein, uh, you can get away from monocropping. Um, and... Uh, and that, I think, is a very positive thing from a food security standpoint. So that's something that is not part of our current, you know, recipe or anything like that. But it's a separate endeavor, which is looking at the fact that, you know, our goal is to be a huge part of the global protein supply. And that means we have to be very uh, thoughtful in our choices of, you know, the crops that we get from and um, and so that's something else that we're working on, but you don't hear about it because it's not in our current product yet. But but we, I think it's a very good point, and we take it very seriously. Great, I think it was a great answer, and interesting to learn about that. I'm going to pass it over to Ashley for the next question. All right. So speaking of supply chains and building supply chains, given that you know um, you're an entrepreneur, you're developing, you know, a, a product that, as, as we were talking about before, is continuing to be improved. Um, how do you ensure that sustainability measures are, um, are part built into that supply chain that you're essentially, from what I am, I'm understanding, you're building from scratch? Are you built from scratch? Um, well, I mean, there's the simple answer is, um, you know, since we are completely a mission-driven company, um, a, you know, the way that we choose what goes into our product and, and where we source it and so forth um, is highly determined by 
you know, the environmental impact. And so we're very systematic in looking at all the data on um, environmental impacts when we're choosing ingredients. And, um, and we're always going to do that. So, I mean, that's really the gist of it. And what we were just talking about with respect to the soybeans and leaf proteins and stuff like that is, you know, at any given time, the, the ingredients for our commercial products are balanced between the ideal, which is what we're moving toward, and, and what's available right now. Uh, but we make choices about what's the... And of course, the other thing to keep in mind is actually... You, you would have to be trying desperately hard to um, create a plant-based food that even comes close to being as destructive as the animal-derived version. So we start out with like, there's, it's almost impossible for us not to be better than, than the cow. Um, that's, you know, we want to be even better than that, but, but that's just something to keep in mind here. You know, when you, when you talk about monocropping or something like that, uh, you know, uh, well, we use vastly less soybeans than it takes to produce a pig. Um, so, you know, it's even though we. Uh, anyway, there you go. Great. Um, so the next question I have for you, um, seeing as we're still in a pandemic, um, with the pandemic, we've seen a large impact on the meat industry. That's something we've heard in the news, um, particularly, you know, the large meat processing facilities. Um, I was curious, yeah. yeah. If Impossible has encountered any challenges or possibly opportunities um, due to the virus. Well, I mean, uh, challenges. Yes, we've encountered challenges. For one thing, um, you know, we have, uh, um, we take our employees very seriously. And I would say the only thing that probably trumps our mission in, in guiding our actions is, is taking care of our employees. And so um, when the, you know, when we saw the um, spread of COVID uh, starting to happen, uh, we were probably one of the earliest companies uh, around to um, ask our employees to start working from home, um, and uh, and you know that for some parts of the business, particularly the R and D component, um, that slowed us down. But you know we felt like, well, you know we can't put our employees at risk. Now, uh, in the meantime, then we've put in all sorts of. Um, uh, transmission control measures uh, in our workplace, but we're still somewhat compromised because part of the transmission control is you you control the density of people in the in the place, and you you put in a lot of things that get in the way of the normal operation. I'd say we're probably up like back to seventy five percent of our R and D productivity at this point, but that's still an issue. And of course, the R and D is the ultimate driver of our mission in my mind. So that's a compromise. In our production facility, it's very different from a slaughterhouse. I mean, it couldn't be more different. Um, you know, for one thing, uh, uh, you know, the process doesn't start with a bunch of miserable animals covered in their own feces being driven up a chute into the building and, you know, and slaughtered. It is a bunch of very carefully quality controlled ingredients uh, that get delivered where we we do, um, but anyway, there's 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 that, and then the production facility itself, um, it doesn't involve you know the kind of brutal manual labor that goes on in a slaughterhouse where you have just dense people and and carcasses whizzing by, uh, where the the productivity of that facility is heavily dependent on on a, a very crowded work environment. Um, so it was quite easy for us to socially distance in our production facility. Uh, we put a lot of additional measures in place with face shields and masks and, and partitions and stuff like that, but the density is low. And the workers there, rather than doing this kind of brutal, repetitive manual labor, are just operating equipment. Um, and the equipment is just like what you'd see in a bakery. It's like giant mixers and things that 
that you know form our ground beef into burgers or whatever and so forth. Um, so uh, it's just inherently much easier to keep keep safe. So we've had no, you know none of our employees uh, have been infected uh, to our knowledge, and um, uh, so there's that. Otherwise, I mean, the the fact is most of our customers. Uh, um, when the epidemic started, were restaurants, um, and most restaurants were severely impacted. Um, and um, so, you know, we did a bunch of things in terms of changing the commercial part of our business. Uh, one is we helped a lot of our restaurants go into the business of of uh, selling online or selling selling actually the our products directly to consumers, basically being like little grocery stores. And so forth. So that actually was was um, uh, quite helpful for a lot of them. Um, and uh, and then we turned, we amped up our effort in launching retail. So we went from at the start of the epidemic being in 150 grocery stores on um, just New York and California, basically, or New, New England, and uh, to um, about 5,000 retail grocery stores uh, nationwide. And then we also launched a direct-to-consumer sales channel through our website, uh, and that's going extremely well with like no no publicity whatsoever. Within 24 hours, uh, we'd had customers from uh, all the 48 states of the continental U.S. Uh, so um, so we just we we had to we had to make some changes in the commercial part of our business, and we had to. Institute safety measures for our own facilities and so forth. Um, the other thing is that because the disruption in the, the you know animal-based uh, supply chain, um, I think a lot of customers that you know are highly habituated to just kind of sleepwalking through the grocery store and grabbing you know ground beef from the meat counter or something like that um, suddenly have an incentive because of the supply issues. Uh, to wake up and look elsewhere. And so we think a lot of, uh, um, we don't expect to increase our customers because it's just basically limited by our ability to distribute, but um, but new customers who are meat eaters are trying our product. And like I say, we know we have very good data that more than you know a majority of them um, become repeat customers. So I think it's going to have a long-term uh, boosting effect on our business. Not that I wish any harm on, on the people who are affected, but um, it is what it is. Yeah, that's great. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll switch over to the audience questions. So I'll pass this over to Ashley. All right. Yes, thank you so much for your thorough answers, Pat. We appreciate them. So we excited most uh, about uh, the future of impossible foods and what's on the horizon. So I, 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 that sentence got partly broken up. Could you say it again? Sure, absolutely. Sorry about that. I, I was just asked uh, what you're most excited about in terms of Impossible Foods' future. What's on the horizon? Oh, well, I mean, I, you know, I get excited about, I mean, every aspect of it is exciting. Like I just, I, I, you know, I, 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 I had the best job in the world when I was at Stanford and it was unimaginable that there's anything that could, just be more stimulating and engaging than that. But turns out Impossible Foods is, is it because it has all the intellectual and strategic challenges. And on top of that, the impact is so, so huge. I, I'm, so I'm interested in, in all the stuff that we're working on from the basic science, building our understanding of things that are actually barely studied at all. Like a lot of the behavior of proteins in foods that come from animal tissues is completely different from the way those proteins behave in keeping the animal alive, okay? And actually, that the behavior as it relates to food is virtually not studied at all. So there's a lot of, uh, and it's kind of just fundamental kind of mechanical and biophysical properties of proteins that are relevant to texture and juiciness and so forth. It's just like a, an area that's, that's barely been touched. So we're doing, a, we're doing interesting research there we uh, we're, a lot of the fundamental research is very interesting. Also, understanding flavor, chemistry, and mechanism, and so forth. In terms of products, um, we are um, 
Of course, we're always working on the next generation of our burger product because it is, like I say, I think it's still the highest impact product that we can make. We're working on whole cuts like steak and stuff like that, uh, which is a, a bunch of a diff, a additional kind of technical and engineering uh, challenges there. And then we're also working on our, our long-term uh, protein toolkit, including you know uh, proteins from leaves and and from other sources. The interesting thing is so much of the ag system was sort of set in place. The decisions that defined the current ag system were made centuries ago. And and uh, and a lot of them were, were premised on the idea that a lot of the ag system basically produces food by feeding animals that, you know, and, and the requirements there are very different than if you're you're growing things to produce human food. So that's another fun area is to think about, okay, if you're looking for crops whose traits are optimized for making human food, um, that that has the properties of meat. Okay, I'm not talking about kale or you know uh, French fries or something. But uh, um, it's an interesting challenge because that's not something that that people who thought about what the food system should be really really uh, worked on. So that's a very fun uh, area for me. That's one of the most interesting areas. Like thinking about the in the long run, what's our supply chain look like? And and how do we optimize it for a plant-based meat production? Absolutely. Fantastic. I think that was a great answer. And now we have some time for some audience questions, which I'm happy to see popping up. Um, one is, what makes the Impossible Burger or your other plant-based meat products um, better than competitors? You know, what sets it aside? Are there any sustainability aspects or anything else like that that makes it possible better than well first of all better. um i think that i i i i think the 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 what the uh question was asking about was how, how are we better than other plant-based meat producers so first let me correct an assumption we don't think of them as competitors we have zero interest in taking business away from other plant-based food producers that that accomplishes nothing for our mission as far as I'm concerned, if you love your Boca burger or your Beyond burger or whatever you're eating, um, I, I don't even, I, I just assume to some, some extent prefer if you just keep eating that uh, because the only sales that make an impact for us are sales to uh, omnivores. And I'll just parenthetically say 90% of all our consumers are omnivores. They've eaten meat from animals in the past month. So that's the consumer we care about. And actually that's part of what distinguishes us from um, the uh, um, other, any other plant-based meat um, producer is that um, historically they've defined their target consumer as someone who is looking for an alternative. And, um, and that is a much lower bar than if you uh, are going after, you've defined your target consumer who's as someone who's not even thinking about an alternative, they're just thinking about eating meat. And um, you know, if 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 someone is looking for an alternative, they'll just buy the best available alternative. Okay, we don't want to just be the best plant-based product on the market. For us to achieve our mission, we have to be the best meat on the market, in in defined in the ways that matter to consumers. And so that's why from the get-go, we were totally R and D based. OK, because we knew at the time that nobody knows how to make a product from directly from plants that a meat lover will consider more delicious than the animal product. And that was a deep research problem. And we invested in that. In fact, we, you know, like I said, we didn't even think about making a commercial product until like three years after the company was founded, because we knew we're not going to waste our time. We thought early on we could make. And, and, and it was true, actually, we could make a product that's better than all the other plant-based products out there, but we weren't going to launch it until it was good enough for Dave Chang and people like him to put on their menu as meat. And um, so I would say that the, the, to get to cut to the chase, A, we have no interest in competing with other plant-based food producers. 
It doesn't make any sense from a mission standpoint. It doesn't make any sense from a business standpoint. That entire market is like 1% the size of the, the animal-based meat market. So if we felt like, oh, we're going to just duke it out for that 1% of the market, it would be idiotic. From a business standpoint and from a mission standpoint, it would be irrelevant. Um, uh, but anyway, so the point is, the premise of the question was, was a little bit off, but the answer is, we treated this as the hardest, you know, one of the hardest and the most important scientific questions in the world and did the hard research work to figure out how to make products that will actually deliver for hardcore meat lovers. And I don't think anyone else has done that. Great. Thank you. By the way, let me just say, um, we just, in the past two weeks, we launched uh, uh, our sausage product. Um, and it is available in every Burger King in the U.S. as the Impossible Cross Sandwich. Um, apologize for that name. I didn't make it up. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also in, in uh, essentially every Starbucks, 15,000 Starbucks, um, as a breakfast sandwich. Um, and you've got to check it out. I think that... Uh, if the sausage doesn't knock your socks off, then you're probably not wearing socks. <laughs> Great. I'll have to try it. All right. Pat, we have another question from the audience. This question is coming from Sophia. She asks, how do you plan to make your product more accessible to lower income families that can't afford the higher prices of these meatless options that tend to be pricier? Yeah, absolutely. So, First of all, that's an extremely important goal for us. I mean, uh, just as as a side background that, you know, the uh, protein deficiency is by far the biggest macronutrient deficiency globally and it affects almost a billion people. And it significantly affects them. It causes uh, kids to be, you know, uh, their, their growth to be in, impaired, uh, their learning ability to be impaired and so forth. Uh, the biggest micronutrient deficiency is iron deficiency, which affects almost 2 billion people globally. And, and so um, since our product is a great source of protein and iron, uh, it's been a big part of our motivation from a very early stage and not just make it available to, you know, poorer people in the U.S., but poorer people globally who, have, who, who you know, are very, very uh, limited um, resources. The, the fundamental economics of producing our product are vastly superior to making a product from a cow. Because basically, think of the inputs that go into making beef from a cow or from, from another animal. Land, water, uh, um, you know, fertilizer, um, uh, often uh, pesticides, and labor. Well, because we make our product, we sort of cut out the middleman. You don't have to, you don't have to, you know, uh, turn your plants uh, into a cow extremely wastefully and inefficiently, and 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 waste a lot of that investment and so forth. Um, you know, the structural economics are better for us. Um, but the problem for us right now is there are a lot of fixed costs, and and we have to get to scale. Uh, and sunk costs, we have to get to, to scale to realize sort of the fundamental advantages of our way of, of producing meat. But, but at scale, there's no question that we ought to be able to produce it and sell it more cheaply than, than the animal-based products. And that's a very, very important goal for us. It's also, frankly, to be honest, even people who, have, uh, who are not desperately poor um, the fact that the price of our product right now is higher than the price of the cow product is a barrier to trial. Um, you know, for meat lovers who are perfectly happy with their cow version, why should we pay extra for a plant-based product? Um, so, um, so we're highly motivated to bring the cost down. But, but like I say, the, the issue is, you know, uh, um, you don't realize the, the fundamental structural benefits of our process Immediately, you have to get to a certain scale before before they start being real. Great. Well, thank you so much. We are running against our time limit now, but I do want to make one quick note. 
is that where you can try an impossible burger. Um, one thing is, um, as you mentioned, you can buy them through your online website, direct to consumer. Um, so if you're in lockdown right now and not going out, you can also support local restaurants that are serving the impossible burger. And that's also a feature that you guys have on your website to locate restaurants in your area. Nice. Um, so those are two ways. And then I also want to say for the MUSC people listening, the impossible burger is being served in the MUSC cafeteria. Um, so that's something awesome. that we've been doing for a little while and we're happy about. Check it out. You got to start serving the sausage too. It's unbelievably good. <laughs> we'll do. We'll have to look into that. But thank you so much. Um, anything else you want to say? Uh, no, that's been great. I, I really enjoyed talking with you. Uh, if you're interested in buying our product at retail, I'll just say that uh, it's available nationwide in uh, Safeway, Albertsons, Kroger's, uh, HEB. Um, I don't know which ones you, 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 you have in your area. And the Safeway Albertsons also includes Jewel and uh, um, Kroger's has a bunch of sort of sub divisions with their, with their own names, which I haven't memorized, unfortunately. But it's at this point, we're in more than 5,000 or, you know, uh, retail stores. We're soon going to announce a couple of very familiar, uh, very widespread retail customers. So it'll be almost unavoidable. I mean, it's almost going to just kind of come after you from the uh, <laughs> grocery shelf before long. Aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, it's mostly in the meat section. So um, just uh, we want it to be where meat lovers are looking for meat. And so uh, most of the grocery stores are selling in the meat section if you're wondering where to look for it. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, yeah, Pat. Thank you. Thanks to everyone that tuned in today. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining. Okay, thanks. Good talking to you. Bye-bye.